Today, we bring salt, the symbol for peace. Salt was still used and, sorry, salt was and still is used as a preservative. And this passage suggests we should be like salt, preserving peace amongst one another. The Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter, verses 42 to 50 causing to stumble. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it will be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Let us pray. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Lord, sometimes we struggle in our lives to be good people. We may argue or hold a grudge against someone. We pray that you would flavor our lives, that we may be a salt and live in peace with each other. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Special welcome to those people here, uh, to our preacher, Janet Patrick, more from her later. Uh, to those people uh, on Zoom at home and those who will be watching the recording of this service later in the week. Uh, I have another, a small number of announcements uh, before uh, the start of our service. Um, the first is to say that unfortunately our annual church meeting, which was due today after the service, had to be postponed uh, and we will be rearranging it later in the year. Secondly, um, our morning service next week um, will be led by uh, our own local preacher of our cellars and not uh, by the Reverend Christine Fox uh, as previously announced because of illness uh, and we're very uh, much looking forward to a speaker from our Rocha, the Eco Church uh, movement who will be uh, playing a major part in our service next Sunday. Next Saturday morning, uh, there is a meeting at 10 o'clock in the church for, uh, to discuss the future of the church support worker and uh, uh, to generate ideas for um, uh, that such a worker to undertake in the coming year. Uh, we've, uh, there's been an item about this in the newsletter for a couple of uh, weeks and uh, any uh, contributions will be very much welcome um, uh, next Saturday morning at 10 o'clock here in the church. 
We'll be hearing more about the difficult situation in Ukraine, of course, throughout the service. Um, but I wanted to say that there are uh, envelopes for the Disasters Emergency uh, Committee appeal uh, in the coffee bar and in the church hall uh, if you want to make a, 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 a contribution and particularly if you want that to be gift aided, please use one of the envelopes to support. I've already welcomed Janet, but I'd like to do so again. Janet's been a kind of a local preacher uh, in this church and circuit for many years, and it's always a great pleasure to see you here, 20 years, um, and we very much look forward to hearing your message, Janet, um, and uh, there will be a few minutes silence before Janet leads our service today. Good morning everyone and welcome to worship this morning, especially those of you who are also at home. I'm very glad to be here. It's a long time since I've been here on a Sunday morning. I come on a Sunday evening. But I must say when I saw the notices this week, I was even more delighted because even Chris Hugh Smith, that great honorable Methodist president of conference, had only ever wanted to be one of Mr. Wesley's preachers. Even he did not aspire to see his name in the notices as Chris Hugh Smith preacher. Thank you for that honor of being named Janet Preacher. I know they've changed it now, but when I saw it, it was different. At opening hymn this morning is number 28, Jesus calls us here to meet him as through word and song and prayer we affirm God's promised presence where his people live and care. Number 28. It. I should have told you that we usually sing the last verse only when we have communion. We come now to our prayers of thanksgiving and confession. Let's each one of us pray. Loving God, we have come to worship you in you and thank you in this season of Lent. And we are so aware that we are in very troubled times. We thank you, Lord, that you are always with us. You never let us go. 
that we are loved by you, and that your love is for all humankind, for the oppressed, but also for those who oppress. Help us always to see your image in everyone we meet, but in especially in those that we might call enemies. We have so much to thank you for this morning. The beauty of the coming of spring and the spring flowers, the lighter evenings. We thank you for the many things and comforts that we take for granted. But most of all, we thank you for sending Jesus to live as one of us and for his time in the wilderness. Help us, Lord, as we face our own temptations Loving God, we live in a Western world where we give in to temptation so easily. We value material goods and we do not want to wait. We want instant success. Help us to learn from those who are poor in earthly terms, who wait for their harvest and who are so generous with their time and possessions. Help us to use our time wisely this Lent and to use our money and our time for others. We ask forgiveness for the many times we forget you and think only of ourselves. Help us to see this world through your eyes. We ask these prayers through our friend and redeemer, Jesus. And now let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Now I'm going to, I thought I couldn't come down from the pulpit to talk to the children, but I am going to. The, do you know I find that grown-ups listen harder to the children's talk than they do sometimes to the preacher. come down here to be near you but also I've got something to show you now this is a time of Lent when Jesus went to a wilderness we can think of it really as a desert and there he could pray and get close to God and think about what he was going to do with his life's work now in Lent we are asked to look at ourselves to look at the things we are sorry about but I think we need also to look at the things that we are doing well I'm sure you're doing some things well and to do them better. So it's a time when we look at ourselves. Now, grown-ups, this is where I'm going to put the grown-ups on the spot. I'm warning you. We are asked in Lent often to give something up or do something. Shall I tell you, I'm not very good, but what I'm giving up is breakfast. That's really nothing special. But what I also said I'm going to do is read the book of Mark through with a very good commentary. I'm going slowly, but I shall get there by the end. But when I wanted to ask, are there any grown-ups who are brave enough to stand up and tell us anything different they're doing in Lent? Nobody? I can't believe you're not doing things. I know the Anglicans are perhaps a bit stricter. Is there anybody brave enough? Or shall I have to pick on somebody? That would be terrible. Right, well, never mind. I will tell you what I did when I was a very little girl, 10, which is 70 years ago, and I lived in Wales. And in those days, sweets were a real special treat. There were sherbet lemons, or some of the sticky ones. I, I brought one or two with me. And I decided that I would go through Lent. I had to depend on people giving me sweets because we didn't buy them. Uh, but if they said, Janet, would you like a sweet? What would I say? Should I say, no, thank you? I should have said that, but I didn't. I had a little box. And I said, thank you very much. I'll put them in my box and keep them for Easter. 
Do you think that was cheating? <laughs> well, so I have bought, and I wanted to bring a box, and it used it, I, I looked for a very old box, but I couldn't find a very old box until I found this morning. Do you know what? Anybody can guess what this box is? Cigarettes. <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> it says the Caswell Promise Box exceeding great and precious promises. It was given me by my grandma, who loved me a very great deal, as I loved her. And do you know what it has inside it? I'll read one to you. I've marked one, so I'll get the right one. And now I've lost it. So it's Bible text. Loads of them. They're slight. Well, I, I can't see the one I wanted to read was about God's love. So I'll just pick anyone and read it to you. Dear me. It is so small, I can't hardly see it. He should be, he, notice, shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed on trusting God. Psalm 112. So that's, something. Anyway, I wanted to ask you, if I gave you a little Easter egg, could you wait and keep it till Easter? <laughs> Hands up those that could. Well, this is a test and, and <laughs> we'll find out because I'm going to ask Leslie after Easter to find out <laughs> if you did. What do you think? Do you think she'll do that? She woke us up after already. <laughs> so this is my this is a new box, a Christmas present, and I'm going to, who shall I give it to? Shall I give it to Peter? I don't know how many there are of you, but I don't expect, I expect, can you see what they are? They're not, they're not, nor am I advertising Cadbury's, I must say. If I give these to you. In a minute, we're going to have our next hymn, and it is one more step along the world I go. We all know it. But when it comes to the fourth verse, would you children stand up and march around the back, go around the back, and then out the front that way. And we will find out if any grown-ups are brave enough to march with you. Do you think they will? <laughs> I've done it before, and it was a real success. I was in there, they marched, and it was good fun. So let us say a prayer for the children before we have the next time. Loving God, we know how much Jesus loved children, and that he asked, he asked grown-ups to learn from children and be like them. This morning we ask you, Lord, to be with them, not just this morning in their lessons, but that they may know that you are always with them and that you will always love them. Amen. And now we're going to sing the hymn, One More Step Along the World I Go, From the Old Things to the New. And when it comes to the last but one verse, please can the children go up and then that way. And please, please some adults don't help. Thank you.
not hurry. Thank you, and thank the grown-ups especially. <laughs> Our lessons today are taken from the lectionary readings. The Old Testament is Genesis 15, uh, chapter 15, 1 to 12, and 17 to 18. God's word comes to Abraham in a vision, and he promises him great rewards. But Abram is so worried because he is childless that he can not accept it. He does later. The question is, do we have blockages? Thank you. David will... No, Elaine, you're reading the first one. But whatever, I don't mind. <laughs> I'm not going to try to... <laughs> right, and the second one is from Luke's Gospel. The shadow of Jerusalem hangs over this reading. Surprisingly, it is the Pharisees who warn Jesus of the danger. I must be on my way, Jesus answered. Thank you, David. God's covenant with Abram. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate? is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the, the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the, of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. When the sun and had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking brazier with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, amen.
Luke 13, verses 31 to 35. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go, tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. We continue our worship with our next hymn, which is 420. And I'm going to read the second verse. It's about, it's about forgiveness. Because you laughed and loved the childlike, because you lived from day to day, and we love status and steady money, we ask forgiveness, Lord Jesus Christ. Number 420. Sorry. Do you think she might be uh, uh, not having too much fun? Sorry. We're not having the hymn. We're not having the hymn? No. Okay. Fine. So we have the sermon. <laughs> you can say I'm not used to this modern technology. Right. Lent, living in Lent in troubled times. And this has been a hard, hard sermon to write because it's, I, I, because of Ukraine, I feel as if we are all living in a wilderness in troubled times. Lent is our 40 day preparation for the Feast of Easter. It looks back on Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness before he began his mission. And Lent was observed from the fourth century when Christians practiced penance by eating only one meal a day. This fasting was actually as strict as Muslims have now. Uh, their fast for Ramadan, incidentally, Ramadan starts three weeks today on April uh, the 3rd when adults and some children, children wish to do it, are allowed to do it, uh, abstain from eating or drinking between the hours of sunrise and sunset. Lent is a time when we can all examine our lives, traditionally for repentance, but not necessarily all for repentance. We do it in many ways. The Iona community asks their members to examine themselves, and it is a very strict discipline how they spend their time, how they spend their money, and how they spend their time with God. Many years ago in Beeston, we had inter-church study groups, which used material from the British Council of Churches. We joined with other churches, and it was such a refreshing experience. I still remember it. Slightly different emphasis in different churches. Margaret Hepplethwaite, a theologian from Cambridge, now living in a tiny village in South America, and that's part of the point of this, writes about Lent. In Lent, which we have now entered, we live again in the wilderness period, the trial and temptation period, when we look forward to the promised land of Easter. I am going to do something unfashionable, she says, I'm going to invite you to repent of your sins. And she continues, our society 
has become almost incapable of living in a season such as Lent. Lent, these days, is feasting without the fasting. Every Sunday, we say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. But we are also asked to forgive ourselves. And sometimes it is hard, I know it is, to forgive yourself harder than to forgive somebody else. So I think sometimes if we do find it so very difficult, another way is to think of the things that we do that we are glad of, that we are pleased with, because we need also to feel good about ourselves and try and do, do more of them. The last two years have been extremely difficult. First, we had the worldwide COVID, and now we have the war in Ukraine. And as I realized this, and I thought about it, I realized this is how millions worldwide live every day, fleeing from war in Ethiopia, living always in poverty in Malawi, where we lived for nine years living an uncertain life of strife in the Sudan, facing all near to civil war, and then in Palestine, where there seems so very little hope. Then I thought about children dying of preventable diseases, living for many years in these countries has changed me forever and made a big difference to me. When struggling with this service, and I did struggle because I felt I was in a wilderness, I was looking for inspiration, which I gained in a very strange way. Um, I was coming out of the Anglican church yesterday morning, ready, as I am a, I am a local councillor, to knock on doors and ask if, uh, in my ward, which is this ward, I'm a Labour councillor, if we could help people. And as I came out, so I met Michael Taylor. I don't know if any of you know Michael Taylor. If you don't know him, you will not forget him. He speaks Russian. He's a theologian, Anglican, and priest. Before that, he was a Roman Catholic priest. And we got talking about the situation. I was going to walk around Beeston. He said, I'm going to the church for two hours because it's open and I need to pray. And then at the end of our, it was a fairly brief discussion. He said, he said to me, do you know, it may end better than it started. I thought, what a hope is that? What a wonderful hope. And throughout terrible times, we need to live in hope. And then he blessed me and he said, may the Prince of Peace go with you. And that made, it was a real inspiration to me. We have to realize, I'm not decrying, I'm not saying anything is not terrible, it is. But we know that good things can come out of bad. Despite much suffering, Good did come out, some good came out of the pandemic. Communities, old and many new, rose up to care for each other. Strangers became pr uh, friends. The people of this borough raised 30,000 pounds to share out with those in need. And I looked back yesterday, because I was the mayor at this time, and it said, Janet, you, must, you wrote seven letters thanking people yesterday, you've got five more to do today. And it was, a wonderful time in the sense, all sorts of people. People baked cakes and gave them everywhere. A little girl drew pictures on stones and she sold them. She sat in Bramcote and she sold them, raising a hundred pounds. Terrible times can produce acts of love and kindness. But then how can we react to these terrible times when people in the Ukraine face daily death and we do not know how long it will go on. Michael Taylor said to me that he thinks that the chemical warfare is very likely because Kiev was once the capital of Russia and they will not wish to bomb such very beautiful old buildings. So an alternative might be chemical um, response. I hope and pray this will not be so. Our first inclination and this is true not just of us Christians but of other people and people of other faiths is to pray to pray and what came to my mind was John Wesley's the his last words the best of all God is with us 
The best of all, God is with us. And so that means that we are not on our own. That makes, to me, it makes an enormous difference. However terrible times are, God is with us. And we need to pray to God, who is a God of love, and pray for the Ukrainians, but also for the Russians people, for all who are involved in war. I do believe that prayer will make a difference and that we should all pray for peace. Pray without ceasing. We should all need to speak out. And this is where I hope I'm not making any more mistakes. And I have brought to you the statements that the president of the Methodist Conference has made. If you have read it, please forgive me, but I do find it very helpful. The statement on 25th of February, the statement of Ukraine from the Methodist presidency, we are horrified and heartbroken as we witness the violent assault on Ukraine by the Russian military. This devastating action and ensuing loss of life have rightly been condemned across the world. It is a very clear violation of the UN Charter and as such imperils the foundation upon which international security is built and on which we all depend. We regret the failure to build an understanding with Russia, and we pray for the Ukrainian and Russian peoples, including the Methodist church leaders in the region and the Methodist communities across Ukraine. Christians are called to pursue peace with everyone. Pursue peace. This mandate, mandate is clear and requires courage, perseverance, and understanding. We ask you to pray for all politicians that they may be an end to aggression and that dialogue, justice, and peace may be established. I don't think that was easy for the president to write, but I think this next statement is harder because it was written by the orthodox clerics, over nearly 200 of them, and they are in a, a difficult position. This is what they said. Respect the freedom of any person given to him or her by God, adding that the people of Ukraine must make their own choices by themselves, not at the point of our assault rifles and without pressure from either east or west. The letter says clerics bewail the suffering that has been undeservingly imposed on our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. It is very rare for such a large number of religious clerics of the Orthodox Church to openly challenge President Vladimir Putin's government. In recent years, the Russian Orthodox Church and its leader, Patriarch Kirill, who did not sign the letter, have fully supported Putin's policies. The end. We call on all opposing sides for dialogue because there is no other alternative to violence, the letter says. Only an ability to hear the other side can give us hope to get out of the abyss our countries were thrown into several days away. Let yourself and all of us enter the Easter Lent in the spirit of faith and love. Stop the war. Only an ability to hear the other side can give us hope to get out of the abyss our countries were thrown into. And let yourself and us all enter the Easter Lent in the spirit of faith and love. Stop the war. How then can we demonstrate faith and love? We are called to pursue peace. It is very difficult for many people. We would not all take the same views. I am giving up my own, and I know some people may feel very differently. We have to disagree in good faith. We pray. We continue to pray. But action must come next. What can we do? We must all make up our own minds and hear our mind. I start with my own response to the statement that I've just read to you. But I've also visited Ukraine and found that a very poor country, but very friendly people. I visited twice. So after prayer... What do we do? But in reality, we keep, keep on praying. But prayer must be followed by action. The response of the countries surrounding Ukraine, welcoming over two million refugees, shows that the worst of times can produce the best human response. They do not ask for visas. They have great queues of people waiting. 
They are poor people. They are not wealthy. My brother-in-law has a close relationship with Moldova, has visited it many times, but the generosity of the poor puts us to shame. All over the world, people want to help, including many people in Britain. And this help must also involve welcoming them to us. I know without asking that many of you will already have sent money. I just know that. I don't even have to ask. And the government has been doubling donations up to £20 million. The Ukrainian church in Nottingham, which is working very closely with many churches, says don't send goods now. We have enough goods. You can easily send wrong goods. In Malawi, several times, we had goods that are, I wish they hadn't been sent. They weren't needed. And it, it, it makes sure that what you're sending is what people want. That's all I'm saying. We need to welcome refugees from other countries. In Beeston, we have a very good track record, and so does the council. We already have refugees from Afghanistan. We have, uh, we're living very close to this church. We have uh, quite a number of Syrians, uh, and we have many, many asylum seekers who we don't know where, th where they are. And our council, and we had a council meeting last week, said that we are willing to place and help with refugees. And we have a meeting tomorrow about it. So it's not just churches, it's councils and all people of goodwill. And I know people who will have offer, because they said so before, to have people living with them. But finally, we are called to speak out, to speak against war. It will need dialogue, compromise. The meetings have not started well, we know that, but that is bound to happen. We must pray for all politicians involved in talks between Ukraine and Russia. It does not help to be aggressive ourselves or demonize the Russians. Somebody very close to me said, Putin, Putin is Satan. I cannot say that. And the possible escalation of the war must be avoided. Wesley's final words, the best of all, God is with us, but God is also in the midst of all the pain, all the suffering in the world and in Ukraine. We began with prayer, knowing that God's in the midst of all suffering. The conflict has made us realize more than ever that we are part of one world. That one world is God's family. So let us close the sermon with prayer. Holy and gracious God, we pray for the people of the Ukraine and the peoples of Russia, for all their countries and their leaders. We pray for all who are afraid, that your everlasting arms hold them in this great time of fear. We pray for all those who have power over life and death, that they will choose for all people life and life in its fullness. And we pray for those who choose war, that they will remember that you direct your people to turn our swords into plowshares and seek for peace. Above all, Lord, today we pray for peace in Ukraine. We ask in the blessed name of your blessed Son. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Now we come to our next hymn, though I am a little nervous. <laughs> uh, if you could bring it up, then I could... Fine. It is <laughs> hymn number 665. If you have a hymn book, I'm not... I've cheated on the tune and chose Down Anthony instead of the set tune. Make us prophets, Lord, who truly hear your word, which fires us with your Spirit's inspiration.
please sit down. Now, before Leslie takes our prayers of intercession, I just ask the stewards not to bring now, but after the prayers, would they bring the uh, offertory forward for the offertory prayer? Thank you. Leslie. To the bidding, Lord, in your mercy, would you please respond, hear our prayer. God, our Father, grant us the help of your Spirit in our prayers for the salvation of all people. We pray for the Church of God throughout the world, and on this 13th day of the month, the Methodist Prayer Handbook directs us to pray for Cuba where the Methodist Church has grown over the period of the pandemic, for the Dominican Republic and for Puerto Rico, still recovering from the effects of hurricanes in, nine, in 2017 and an earthquake in 2020, leaving the people poor and vulnerable. We pray for places where Christians are persecuted and ill-treated Comfort and strengthen them, Lord, that they may know that there are people in the world who are concerned for them. Let us pray for this church and all its members and friends, that we may work together to help the local community and advance your kingdom by so doing. We pray that our minister, Alistair, may gain health and strength and be restored to us, and that in faith and unity we may be constantly renewed by your Holy Spirit for mission and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who have power and influence, and for all who govern the nations, that they may seek justice, freedom, and peace for all. Let us pray for all those driven by war, famine in their own lands to seek refuge in another country, that they may be helped and welcomed and made to feel of value. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our country where some communities are still suffering the effects of the recent storms. For those who have authority and influence, for our government, that all may serve one another in wisdom, honesty, and compassion. We pray for our local councillors, whose strength is representing people where they live and serving the needs of the district. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those among whom we live and work, for all our neighbours and friends, that we may use your gifts wisely and together find joy in your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all in sorrow, need, anxiety or sickness, that in their pain and weakness they may know your strength and in despair find hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In you, Father, we are one family on earth and in heaven. We remember in your presence those who have died, giving thanks especially for those who have revealed to us your grace in Christ, and shared with us love and friendship. Help us to follow the example of your saints in light and bring us with them to the fullness of your eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Loving Father, all that we have comes from you. We give back what is already yours. Be with us and help us to use money aright for your service. Amen. Our next hymn, which is one human family God has made, and all for each to care, one world to be a home of all, with all its wealth to share, was written by Rosemary well Wakelin, known Rosemary for a very long time. She's now in her 90s. She and her husband were missionaries in Kenya and had to come out because of the Mau Mau. And her son, Mark Wakelin, some of you will remember him here. He he was a student who was on note with John, with John, my husband, to preaching. He also became president of conference. This is a lovely hymn, and it says exactly what I want to say. One human family God has made, and all for each to care. And after it, um, after it, will you please stay in your seats, and we will have a prayer up for, I will say the words, the words in bold, you say the words light. Is that I've got it the right way around? Anyway, and then um, Chris is going to play the Ukrainian national anthem for us on the organ. Right. Let us let us stand to sing. Sending out, God of wonder. Send us out with hearts full of grace. God of wilderness. Send us out with hearts full of grace. God of the rainbow covenant. Send us out to live among with all people. God of the cross and resurrection. Send us out to be joyous Amen. Let us say the grace to each other. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.